Tommy and Inga, how are you? Good, good morning, you. Anton. You're good, yeah. thank you. And yes. we're very excited to be here. All right. Awesome morning to all the people watching on the live stream and watching on the replay. I'm so excited about this discussion this morning because uh, this are the people behind Crosta Pizza. And uh, <laughs> a lot of the, there's already a lot of legend stories about you guys and uh, wanted to hear directly from you guys. What did you guys do from the moment you started until, of course, uh, during this pandemic? And uh, if you guys are watching, you want to join our discussion, please feel free. You know, if you have questions for them or just uh, support, just let me know. And, um, you know, uh, my name is, uh, so my name is Antonias, founder of our Awesome Planet. We're awesome live with the founders of Crosta Pizza. <clears throat> All right, uh, I'm so excited. Maybe just to get the ball rolling, uh, can you introduce yourself and how did Re Cross Cross the Pizza started? Okay, um, I, I guess I, I'll go first. My name is Inga, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm one of the founders of Crosta. Um, with me is Tommy. Tommy, yeah. Yes, uh, I'm. Uh, I'm more the the chief taste testing expert and the finance guy. Um, but uh, certainly the uh, the pizza queen is uh, is Inga, and um, and you're the tech guy. You are the tech guy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm the cat girl and the pizza maker. Um, yeah. So Crosta actually started off as a, to be honest, as a passion project. It wasn't our main business when we first opened up three years ago, and um, it was just an opportunity that we saw our friends put up the social and they invited us to to open up a pizza place because I had been making pizzas for friends um, prior to opening up Crosta. And it was just something that I really enjoyed doing on the side. And when we opened up, you know, we, we weren't really sure where this business would go, um, how far it would take us. We just thought, you know what, it'll be fun to open up a pizza place that was really well priced in the style that we really enjoyed and um you know in in a in an up and coming area like Poblacion. so we just kind of gave it a shot and here we are now three years later and a pandemic <laughs> and that's kind of how long it took us um and what it took for us to really kind of um get out of our comfort zone um because i think being in, in a container park and being in Poblacion, there were a lot of challenges for us. One, there's there's this um, preconceived notion that if you're in a small space like ours, in um, you know like a food park style, that you know, you, you know there's a there's a certain level that you can't reach in terms of the quality of food. There's that perception yes. that, that right. worked that, that worked against us, and so people would see our pricing. We have a pizza that's as low as two hundred pesos. People would ask if it was a slice of pizza that they were getting <laughs> for two hundred. So they would see the price. They go, "Oh my god, two hundred And then they'd see our area and they go, "Oh my god, container style like." I, I'm not really sure if the food's going to be any good. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> so that was the perception that people kind of um, took away with us. And it wasn't until the pandemic, I guess, because people became more open to trying things outside of their comfort zone. And number two, they didn't see, I guess, the location that we were in. So they didn't have the biases that you would normally um, associate being in a container food park with. Um, and the food, I guess, just spoke for itself. So kind of where we are now. I mean, would you agree with that, Tommy? Definitely. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. you know, they, they do often say that locate, it's all about location, location, location. And I think that, you know, if you if you don't have the location, it can still, I mean, you can still be successful. But I think the path is generally a lot slower because, you know, there's a lot, lot less visibility. There's a lot less people trying your food. And I think on, you know, and Inga was absolutely right. There was a whole lot of factors, I think, going against us, which, I mean, in fairness, you know, I mean, I'm not a big fan of container park food as well. So, uh, you know, if I saw that there was a pizza place there, you know, or there's another one that's, that's sort of in, in kind of the high street area, um, I'd be probably more inclined to try that one um, just because of preconceived notions. So I think you're fighting against a couple of biases there, uh, which, you know, I think it's not impossible, but I think the challenge is it just takes things a little bit longer uh, before you can actually start to grow. Yeah. So... 
uh, I have a question. So, uh, was it really that location? Uh, were you really planning to uh, open up? Or were there plans to open a big restaurant? Or maybe somewhere not in Makati? What was your uh, initial idea when you opened it? Yes. So, look, I might, I might actually answer that one. Um, you know, we're... I would say we're more business people than sort of foodies. And so, you know, we, we took a business approach and one of that, you know, you, you see that in, in kind of my main business is software development. Um, and, you know, businesses in software build in an agile kind of manner. And a part of that is all about getting the product in the hands of the customer, building a minimum viable product, uh, not building the, you know, the stadium and hoping that they come, but actually, it's all about iterative learning and it's all about kind of getting that product in the in the consumer because until you get that that product in their hands and you work out whether they like it or don't you actually don't even have a product and so we weren't considering that we didn't come from food and beverage and while i might have said to her you know your pizza is the best pizza that i've ever eaten uh you know i'm pretty i'm pretty biased right so uh you know and all of our friends liked it as well and and i think what we really needed was to know whether other people like our food and and that was something that we didn't know and so you know, following on from the agile, you know, principles, we found that doing it in a container park was a very uh, uh, cost effective way for us to get the product in the hands of consumers and find out, do we have something that is actually a good pizza? Or is it something that we only like because we're so heavily biased? And, and so I think that was why, you know, we started in the social and for us, it worked really well. I mean, people would look at it and say, well, on a, you know, on a per square meter basis, it's extremely expensive. And yes, that's true. But we also have a whole lot of large amount of seating. And it was just a really great way for us to test the product and see whether it was great. That's right. All right. I think, I think in, in general, when you're in the F&B, the capital to put one up because of the, uh, the furnitures and fixtures that you have to put in and the kitchen, it can be a very costly endeavor. And so like what Tommy said, because we were basically first time F&B people, we kind of didn't want to, um, I guess, take too much of a risk yet without really knowing what we were up against. And so we really kind of mitigated our risks in terms of investing in say, like a really nice dining space mm -hmm. in like the, the best, um, the best kitchen equipment without really knowing whether we had that product that people wanted. And mm -hmm. I think that's also one of, um, one of the silver linings that we, we that kind of saved us during the pandemic because, because I know like with the pandemic, oh, hit, wow. everybody had a lot of wasted space, right. That they were, they were paying rent on, but they weren't utilizing. And, you know, that was one thing that we didn't have. Um, so that was one, yeah, that, that was a decision that we didn't think would amount to this sort of savings, but, um, definitely because we were more risk averse in that particular sense. All right. Now, uh, a lot of people are starting, you know, during the pandemic, and you guys started with uh, against all odds, no? Uh, you know, you were first time in the industry. You were in a container park, and people would just think you're just, you know, one of those yeah. <laughs> food park people making yeah. pizza, like a millennial thing. So how did you, how did you guys overcome that? And how uh, what was the learning during that first part? Because that's very important for people starting today, also. You know, what were uh, the important part to overcome or even outlive that food park? Um, you know, what were the crucial elements that you learned during that time? I think um, personally, one is focused really on the quality of the product and listening carefully to the customers. Like with us, we would get customers who would complain about something and we would really listen to that. And we would like we would assess, is this complaint valid? You know, if it is, how do we improve it? It was a, we're very, we, we like the fact that we are very close when it comes to feedback from the customers, because I think that really helps, but it's really, we, we didn't skimp on the quality of the product. We put the quality of the product first and foremost, and then second was really putting the customer's satisfaction next, because what we may think is good may not be what the customers think is good. And at the end of the day, they are the ones, you know, buying our product. So we really listen to them. And when, you know, when we see a valid feedback, we, we, we act on it. Yeah. And I think to, you know, um, just to add on to that, it's about being authentic and, and honest. And, yeah. you know, it, we, we've made mistakes and we've had, we've gone through growing pains and, you know, I mean, kind of as businesses jump through different sort of 
uh, stages in their life, they, they experience more and more challenges in different ways. So one might be about actually getting someone to buy your product and the next step is to start getting your processes right and all of that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, you know, we may have more people wanting our pizza than we can really produce. And when you look at production rates, uh, there's something called attack time, which is the amount of time in which you can kind of reasonably uh, produce a product uh, for demand. And so we actually were in a situation where, you know, we couldn't meet the demand. And, and so we had to be really honest with our customers. We also had to build processes uh, and, and, and applications, which is what I did uh, to help us to kind of smooth over that demand. Um, but I think we had to be honest and we had to be authentic. We had to say, hey, guys, look, you know, we are struggling to be able to do all the orders, um, you know, Unfortunately, there's only so many people that we can fit into a container, um, and and so I think being honest and, and there are mistakes that you take that you will kind of uh, you will make mistakes along the way, and I think being honest about that is really important rather than hiding behind it. Um, we've always kind of tried to have a business where you know when we're wrong, we're going to be honest and we're going to try and rectify that problem as well. I mean, nobody's perfect, um, and I think that's that's also something that's really important is is being honest. Um, and being authentic too. Right. Uh, let's talk about the quality of your product because uh, that's really top notch. Now, question is, uh, I, I know that's also your secret, but uh, did you start like in the quality of your flour? You said, oh, okay, there's this uh, high quality Tipo 00, let's use that. Or let's use a brick oven, maybe JYC, you know, fire bricks, or, you know, maybe do an Italian fire brick. Uh, how, what was going on in your mind in selecting that quality of product? Uh, I'm sure, you know, that's your secret, but maybe can you just share on how do you look at, you know, in detail, the quality of the product? So I think the way we do our R&D isn't always going for the most expensive because at the end of the day, it needs to make sense from a costing point of view. And so the way we do it is, um, yeah, we'll go for the most expensive one to test it out and see and compare it to what else is out there in the market with, pertaining to flour at least and go for, because there's, you know, if I if I dive into dough, it's gonna be a very long topic. <laughs> I know <laughs> very, that very, yeah. <laughs> very long topic. But all yeah. I'll just say is that just because it's the best product out there doesn't necessarily mean it's also gonna give you the best product. There's a lot of things that go into, I'm sure, like with cooking, it's a lot of things that go into play. Using one product that is the best isn't always going to result in the best product because there's so many other processes that come into play when creating good quality product. So the way we looked at it was really we looked at it more from an economical point of view. How sustainable is the source for us? You know, you really want to be able to have a consistent source of, of, of products. Imagine having the best product, but then it comes in trickles because there's not enough demand in it for that particular product. So one day you might have to use a different flour all of a sudden. So we, we really wanted to have things that were consistently available um, that produce, we, like we thought, closest to the best quality flour that we wanted to use, but, but that's not currently available. And we work with that with the with the with the offense. Actually, that's been a trial and error for us, right, Tommy? It's like, yeah. um, to say the least. <laughs> to say the least, the the, yeah. the brick oven for us um, is a very good oven, but it's it's when you're doing volumes in our oven because I, yeah. I'm sure you've seen it. It's a small yeah. oven, and um, every time you open that door, the heat drops. Yeah. So how do you maintain the quality of your pizzas when you're opening and closing open closing it's not um it's not the most um friendly when it comes to to volume and so we're still in the phase where we're still actually trying out different ovens and yeah we're, we're very open we're not stuck to we're not stuck That's to good. like it needs to be this it needs to be that if no uh -huh. we, we we work we have to work with what's best for for the process that we have to get the best quality product that we have we don't have like a closed off mind saying that it needs to be a certain type of flour or it needs to be a certain type of oven yeah uh -oh. so how do you call your dough the the how, how would you describe your dough how do we describe our dough tommy it's it's really um i, I would say it, that it is it is I, I might answer it's really hard to answer yeah, this it is I would it's say a it's, hard it, it is Years and years and books and books of Inga writing, scratching, trying things. Um, and it was, you know, 
and I was there and I saw it and I would be like, look, this is good enough. And she's like, no, it's not. No, I want it to be like this and it needs to be like. And so I think it's really just, uh, I would say, Inga's creation oh, and and I would say her dedication to something that she's wanted to to look to feel and to taste the way that she really loves. Um, and to her credit, I mean, she she worked on that and she's been working on that dough even before we opened Crosta for three or four years. Uh, so, you know, it's been a very long process. It wasn't just like, you know, Google pizza recipe and and suddenly, <laughs> you know, you're, you're up and running. It really is a long process. So uh, that's why I think, you know, to her credit, she, it's probably hard for her to answer that. But it's really, I would say, a lot of learning and a yeah. lot of mistakes and trial and error uh, to kind of get something. Uh, and I think if she was to talk, um, and not me, she'd probably say she's still probably not a hundred percent happy with, with it. As well. It's true. It's yeah. definitely a labor of love and it's like <laughs> constantly evolving. It never stops. Like there's always something that you can improve on. There's always something that I feel I'm not completely happy with it. It's just when you go into dough, there's so many things that you can do really. Um, so yeah, it's it's a labor of love, and it's it's still not a hundred percent there. I think I think there's still plenty of room for improvement, and those are the things that we're actually very very excited about with the new branches that we're putting up. All right, so let's go to the pandemic. But uh, before we go to that, why is it called Crosta for people watching? Crosta is actually Italian for crust because we are when we when I eat pizza I eat the crust first I'm that type of person because that is the best part for me personally like I think that the quality of a pizza for me personally is defined by how well the crust uh, or the dough is because you can always make you can always put toppings together you can get the best cheese and the best toppings you can put it all together and you know you you get good pizza in terms of the toppings but Making good quality dough, and I'm sure a lot of bread makers will agree, is not an easy feat. It's not. And so for me, that's why we decided to call it crosta because we actually wanted to just pay homage to the crust of the pizza. That's good. Yeah. For <laughs> us, uh, that's how we evaluate our pizzas also. If if the kids can finish everything, uh, including, including the crust, the crust. <laughs> <laughs> then that's really a good pizza. And that's why, you know, that's good uh, on the... Um, Thank you for answering the dough question. <laughs> but let's go to the let's go to the pandemic. So when mm -hmm. uh, the first lockdown started, we're now in our third lockdown. Uh, let's go back. No, how did you think about um, you know that lockdown? What was going on in your mind, and how would you like re-engineer across the pizza? You just survived the you know demise of all the food parks, um, and now we have this lockdown. Uh, can you share with us the story? Um, I would say two things we did, right, Tommy, during the pandemic was one, because we because our other jobs really slowed down, right? Because of the pandemic. We had I had more time to kind of focus on new products. And before the pandemic, we weren't really innovating. And after the pandemic, because we had more time on our hands and we were really trying to figure out how do we further evolve across them, we started coming up with new products such as our Detroit style pizzas, like um, I'm not sure if, if I'm uh, correct in this, but I think we were the first ones to introduce Detroit style pizzas in Metro Manila um, yes. that I know of, at least. Yeah. So that was something that, you know, again, we just wanted to take the risk because we thought, why not? Nobody's doing it. And if people don't like it, then we take it out. That's OK. But what if people like it? What if people want to try something new? So that's when we really got into the innovation uh, part of our product and took some risk and risks in terms of what to produce and two was actually technology really focusing on technology because without the current technology that we're using mm. i probably have a lot more gray hair you know coming down <laughs> like <laughs> it was very very stressful shifting from you know walk-ins to all of a sudden everybody messaging you on your phone yes and on Viber, and on Instagram, and on WhatsApp, and on Facebook Messenger. Can you imagine <laughs> handling all of those inquiries? Yeah. yeah. So, and the expectation you know, with the customer is yes, that exactly. you're going to answer all the time. And they're like, well, yes. hang on a second. I messaged you on Telegram. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, um, every time that there's another uh, medium for someone to contact you, the expectation of the customer is that you will respond, you know, as soon as they message. And, and I think that 
that causes some challenges for smaller businesses. I think if you're a very large business, you obviously have the scale and you have the support function to be able to make that work. But, you know, for us, that was certainly one of our, our, our biggest challenges. Um, and yeah, sorry, Inga, to jump across. No, go ahead. Um, yeah. Because Tommy's background is in technology. Basically, when we saw growth happening, um, and we didn't have the proper processes in place because, like I said, it was always a side business. We saw mm -hmm. a lot of problems coming up. Like we wouldn't be able to answer inquiries on Instagram fast enough. We wouldn't be able to answer increase on text messages fast enough. And so customers were getting upset. And we, we, we couldn't throw more people into the problem because we were in a container van. So we couldn't fit any more people in as well. And, and there so was a the, limit to how many pizzas we could make. Uh, yes. And we were all, this, all of a sudden, you know, Everybody wanted pizza at 11 a.m. And, uh, you know, yeah. when, you, when you've got sort of 300 pizzas to do, you know, at 11 a.m., um, it becomes very difficult, especially when there's only so many that we can make in a given sort of 15-minute period. So yeah. those were some of Inga's really large challenges, and uh, especially looking at the tack time and the demand. And I think, uh, yeah, there were, there were certainly times when, uh, when Inga was, was at um, – at her wits end, I would say nicely. Um, and so, you know, we we were sort of kind of lucky that, you know, my main business is software development and, you know, we're hiring sort of 30 to 50 staff every month. And so for us, uh, you know, we, we build software for some of the largest companies in the world. So, you know, our largest client is over 100 billion uh, market cap. Most of our clients are, are publicly listed companies. Um, and most of their innovation and development work is actually being done out of the Philippines, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, so, you know, we're already hiring. We've got large uh, recruitment teams hiring people. So, you know, we thought, well, why don't we firstly have a look at the market to see if there was something available that could solve this problem for us? And I think we certainly wanted uh, a silver bullet solution. And unfortunately, you know, there just wasn't one that was available. So we were sort of in a position where we just had to build it. And I guess we were lucky that that is the business that we're involved in. Um, and I'm a product designer by, you know, by profession. Yeah, wow. um, and so it was easy for us. We just, you know, we just hired a, a large team and, and then we started building what we wanted for our business and, and dealing uh -huh. with all the challenges that we faced. So it was kind of like a carte blanche where, it's like, well, these are all the problems that Inga's facing. And, you know, we would have nights where I'm like, okay, so what are you what are you dealing with? What are your problems? She's like, well, my problem is this and this and this. And then I was like, okay, okay. So, but we had to, we had to sort of build out uh, something that was going to help to make uh, dealing in the in the pandemic. And, and I think the drastic change from foot traffic driven business to a digital driven business and and heightened expectations with customers and then challenges on the production side. And each one of those are actually pretty significant challenges to overcome. And so when you have them all coming at you uh, at one time, uh, I think that was that was a really, really big, uh, big challenge, but it was it was great for us. Yeah. So the pickup that pH was designed by you guys. Basically, yeah, it was like wow. a, it was That's tag impressive. team. Tommy would come up with a feature. We would test it quickly in Costa. If it worked for us, great. If it didn't, we'd throw it back at him and be like, can you please improve this? It was it was like, yeah, we yeah. worked together on that. And that's why the, the pickup system that we have has actually been tailor fitted for the F&B mm -hmm. industry in particular, because it was all based on the challenges that we were encountering at Costa. Yeah. I mean, it was all actually, it was all her idea. Um, <laughs> and she was the one saying, you know, why don't we just build something? And I'm like, look, it's not, it, you know, it's not that easy. Uh, yeah. Building really good software is that works really well um, and is scalable is exceptionally hard, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's not, really you know, a lot of people get this wrong and they say, oh, I need to develop. I want to build something. It's like, look, you don't really understand software, okay? Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, not, it's not like, you know, I'm going to build, I'm gonna build a house and, you know, it's going to work like that. It's, it's agile. Often more problems arise when you build something um, than before you built it. And then you're constantly kind of building and iterating and validating and changing. And that's why, you know, agile is obviously a continual process. I won't talk any more yeah. about that. I'll, I'll send you to sleep. But basically, <laughs> there was, yeah. it was, you know, I was like, look, I don't really want to have to build this uh, because this is this is going to take a lot of my time. And I know we were pretty busy, you know, during the pandemic. Um, but, you know, to, to Inga's credit, she really kind of laid out exactly how she wanted it to work. She was she did an amazing job in showing that 
there's not something in the market that was able to solve her her challenges. And then, you know, we could see what those problems were in our business. And, and if we were able to solve those problems, you know, we knew what that meant to us financially. Um, mm-hmm. And so there were, there were some pretty compelling reasons on the financial side alone that would warrant us to go down that path. And then given the fact that there wasn't something that was in the market available to be able to do that uh, was also another driver. And so, you know, when we built Pickup, it wasn't actually pickup.ph wasn't built for anybody but us. And we mm-hmm. had a whole lot of friends that were messaging like, oh, can you build something for us? And can you do this for uh-huh. us? And we were like, no, like we don't want to be in that business. You know, we're just trying to solve a problem for our own business. But I think one of the things that came out of that was, you know, and it was Inga that actually kind of challenged me and said, well, you know, what if we did offer this to other people? Yeah. And, you know, and so, you know, from our point of view, we said, okay, well, we don't. We, if we're trying to build a solution to solve a problem in the industry, we don't need to make that cost a fortune. And, and in fact, we could do it, and it could, you know, basically cost nothing. Um, and so we were thinking, well, if you know, the world doesn't need more food pandas, and the world doesn't need more yeah. Grab Expresses and, and Grab Food, because I think that they're there and they do a great job. You know, they're they're there in the market that they play in, and they're fantastic at what they do. Um, what we needed actually was a way to service our existing customer base who wanted to order from us um, and to do that in a, in a manner in which we could control the narrative, we can control the demand, and we could do a whole lot of things to actually have a better experience with our customer. So uh, just uh, to clarify, uh, or because uh, my background is IT, and we were impressed um, with uh, our first time it worked. We were really cynical <laughs> about all this online ordering. Yeah. And we yeah. said, let's, let's try it out. Uh, because w- I'm sure it will fail. But uh, when we tried it out... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we wanted to drive through in Poblacion. That, that was yeah. our real intent. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. it said, okay, within uh, one hour from now, you can pick it up during this time. There's confirmation. And we said, okay, it won't be ready, but let's try it out. <laughs> and yeah. then it worked. It uh, was so amazing. Now... Just a question. Uh, how yep. many pizzas do you do in a day uh, that manages uh, this system? And I guess it's 100% um, digital across all platforms that it handles, correct? Yeah. So I would I would say in terms of the pizzas in a day, it's, you know, it's hundreds, but we can't sort of tell you whether it's, you know, I mean, we, you know, unfortunately, okay. we, we probably, we wouldn't want to, you know, it's, it's, it would be pretty easy to kind of, uh, to go back and sort of go, oh, so, uh, but, um, <laughs> no, look, we, you know, we, 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 we have a reasonable volume. Um, we're, we're pretty happy with it. Um, and I'm sorry that I don't answer the question as directly, maybe as you would like. Okay. Um, yeah. But, you know, is it available on multiple platforms? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's completely responsive and, and it's done through website. So, so what that means is you can do it on your iPhone, you can do it on your Android, you can do it on your TV, even if you want, um, desktop, you know, on your desktop, it's all. And it's how about all- the inquiries? The inquiries funnels through it or, uh, or that's we, we still made, handled separately? So we made it so that majority of the inquiries that we were getting already, we can answer on the platform. Wow. And then it was only kind of the other inquiries that most like that weren't answered that would then go into either our text messages or our Instagram. So we've actually really managed to lower the amount of people who message us on Instagram and directly, I don't know, to maybe like 10% now. There's only a very few people who actually do that. It's it's like troubleshooting them, like, oh, how come it's like this or it's not working? And then just small troubleshooting and then they're back on the website. And once they order on the website, they just continue ordering on the website again. Yeah. So And yeah. I think you need to you need to also wonder, you know, why does the customer want to contact? And yeah. And I think what you really find out is the customer just wants to be updated they want to know what's going on with the order right right? so there's nothing worse than placing an order and saying well did you get my order you know what's going on like you know and there's this panic because you've already paid for something and you're hangry and you want to eat right so there's like a couple of factors that sort of you know uh that that come into play and so i think uh i i think so if you can answer the customer in terms of where are they at in the stage of their of their order and and yes we've acknowledged it and we're making it and this is the various different stages i think you're going to take away the vast majority of the contact points that are required from a customer now you can't take away everything there are some people who you know are in my art there and there's some people who who kind yeah. of uh, you know 
want that that personal service, you'll never be able to remove that. But it's really about removing the vast majority uh, of those inquiries. And, and so that then frees up time for our staff because we are a lean organization that, you know, we're able to actually answer those customers and, and do it, you know, as, as well, not perfectly, but as well as we can. Okay. Now we'll, we'll go to the Detroit pizza because I wanted to really... Uh you know, get into how you guys innovated with that. But uh, Paco Magsaysay said uh, he's a fan. <laughs> uh, I make the best people. Well, uh, he makes the best milk, ice cream, I, uh, yes, everything. Yes, the best milk and the best ice cream. The Rocky uh, Road. We, I love his Rocky Road. Oh, my God. Uh, I would say that I'm more of a fan of his I mean, because we, you know, we are obsessed with with coffee and, and cappuccinos and stuff. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, I we have big gallons of his milk in my office. Uh, yeah. And in uh, and in our condo, we 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 certainly don't make cappuccinos with anything else. <laughs> so thank you, Paco. We love you just as much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's go to uh, Detroit Pizza. How did you guys sure. innovate the Detroit Pizza? Uh, and maybe can you define what a Detroit Pizza for for people watching also? <clears throat> Sure. So I think the, the Detroit pizza originated from Detroit, as its namesake, and it was originally um, made in spare like a spare car part like a, a blue steel pan basically um it's its origin is very similar to a sicilian pizza really so it's thick crust um it's fluffy and it's crunchy in the bottom and what the detroit pizza did that was different from the typical sicilian is apart from using the blue steel pans is they they actually push the cheese all the way to the edge of the pan and because mm-hmm. of um the pan being able to conduct heat very, very, very well, it it created like a cheese crust wall. So, you know, the mm. crust, and because we are crust lovers, right? So when we heard about like a cheese crust, we were like, how can we have not tried this before? <laughs> you know, it was kind of like this curiosity and this need to want to try this new, um, you know, pizza. Uh, so that's the that's the history of Detroit, really. Um, why did we want to do it? It was Tommy's idea who said, why don't we make a pan pizza? <laughs> that's how it started. <laughs> and, um, Only because I was hungry that day, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the way we, we work with, with um, trying to make everything as lean as possible, I think the, what was gonna, what, the deciding factor for us was, can we use the same dough? that we're currently using for our other Mm -hmm. pizzas? And can we make that work with another style? And if the answer is yes, then we said we will proceed with this because what we didn't want this was to have two sets of processes in the kitchen, you know, one making dough for this and then one making dough for this style. We didn't want that. We want, we wanted to be able to, I guess, you know, just be, um, streamline. Yes. Streamline the process. And when we realized that, um, it was just a matter of tweaking, processes and kind of figuring out the best way to 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 rest the dough and things like that we thought wow this actually could fit into our product portfolio and the rest was history i guess okay but uh you guys did a lot of things uh, on the pizza so maybe you can just describe like for example uh, uh um let's say the pepperoni uh, the pepperoni. Uh, um, yeah. you, you get a lot of uh, because the pepperoni is popping. How? What? How? What's the story yeah. of that? How did you guys <laughs> got into that? Uh, uh, we we were in New York before. I'm sure everybody who's gone to New York would have probably chanced upon um, Prince Street Pizza. They were really, yeah. although they were the only ones using cupping pepperonis, they were really the ones who, I guess, made it popular because of social media. But they weren't the only ones using that in New York. Yeah. And when we had that, when we were in New York, we were kind of asking ourselves, why is this not available in the Philippines? And, you know, we we actually, like, imported ourselves. And we thought, like, why why not <laughs> it just it was just a matter of just questioning why not why is it not available here it's a delicious product it works very well with certain styles of pizzas especially the thick crust ones so yes. why why is it not locally available and yeah. again everything stems from that whole question of nobody's doing it why can't we do it and you know I, we just weren't um we didn't feel like we needed to shy away from things that 
just weren't available locally, meaning it just wouldn't work. You know, we were very much open. Yeah, go ahead. Tom. And, yeah, I was I was just going to say, I mean, it, it's just probably oversimplifying it a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was a big challenge. I mean, you know, to, to be able to import food in the Philippines, yeah. obviously, you know, uh -huh. is a, is a yeah. quite a lengthy process. And, you know, when you're when you're dealing with 20 to 35,000 pound of product to import, um, you know, it, it, there's uh, that's a lot. Uh, so, you know, you've got a lot of you got a lot of sticks of pepperoni, um, and so I think, you know, it, that one. Uh, while we're we're super happy to have it there, uh, I think that was wow. one of those sticking points where we were thinking, well, I mean, we're we're all in on this, so let's just hope <laughs> that uh, you know it kind of works. So yeah, and and I and I think we're just really happy that um, that other people like it as well. We we absolutely love it. Um, and we're, you know, we're, yeah, I can't get enough of the, of the cupping pen. Okay. Now, uh, next, um, we'll be asking about pizza. So, uh, what's the story of this, uh, the cheese? The cheese crust? Uh-huh. Yeah, cheese crust. Oh, what is the story of this one? Hmm. This one. Yeah, it's more of, um, yeah. we really, cause you know, we pay attention to what our customers say. So when we first opened up the Detroit style pizzas to people, we would get some comments for certain people like, oh, you know, it's not kid friendly, it's too big for them to eat. Uh -huh. Or we yeah. even we'd even um hear a comment about um not senior friendly either <laughs> because it's I guess hard to eat for the seniors. So we thought, okay, um Filipinos love thin crust. I think we need to come up with a product that kind of marries um the two things. They love thin crust, but they love the cheese crust as well. And again, uh, that this was a lot of trial and error to come up with like a new, this is basically a new style of pizza. Um, and the deep, there's no such thing as a Detroit Inn, actually. That's just something that we came up with. So to better, because, because I know our menu can get really confusing because there's a lot of different styles that we have. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> because people already knew what a Detroit style pizza was and we, they knew that Detroit style meant cheese crust. We just kind uh -huh. of wanted to play to that knowledge already so we just said okay well it's detroit because it's a cheese crust but then let's call it thin so they can differentiate between the thick and the thin but they'll still have the detroit cheese crust um so yeah that's definitely i think a new a, a new product innovation um that we we haven't seen anywhere here yet it was just something yeah. that was born because of what our customers were saying and what we knew and yeah we just came up with something that we thought would would, would please the customers yeah. We put a lot of thought behind the name as well. <laughs> yeah, we got our marketing team to uh, advise us. So it was, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, there's nothing worse thing. when there's just too many things that yeah. they're all new. And then people don't understand, what is this? You know, up until now, people still get confused with our menu because there's a lot of things there that are new. Yeah, very confusing, yeah. It's, it, yeah. It can get confusing. So we really wanted to be able to streamline and it was the easiest thing we could think of. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, that, that's our favorite, especially for driving. You know? the, the pepperoni yeah. would uh, drip on your hands, but uh, the cheese right. is just perfect, actually. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Because we stay in Laguna, so every time we go to Manila, you know, we just pass by. Now, just I a question. By the way, sorry, Anton, I hope you weren't, uh, I hope you're not eating and driving. Uh, I'm sure you're just a passenger, <laughs> right? <laughs> we don't, we don't, uh, we're not encouraging people to eat and drive. Yes, yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, um, so what, what's the reaction of people on the triangle? <laughs> yes. and, and the. Yeah uh the what do you call this the anchovies maybe you can tell us a story uh how did people react to it i this the spinach and artichoke dip stuff for us was actually tommy's idea and oh. this this was something that was um that we introduced during the during the start of our um business i think maybe just a couple of months after we started right tommy i, I don't remember That's anymore right. but it was, so this one was a product yeah. that we've had for a very long time and it was she really because, stuffing yeah. everything in the crust. Right? Yeah, it was. I was, it was like, it was like every day there was like it was stuff like there were all sorts of things stuffed in the crust. So um, <laughs> you know, it was quite a funny time actually. I and there that. is a there, there's a reason for that because I think um I'm well, growing up, my favorite pizza was um Pizza Hut stuffed crust. So yes. I, uh, I used to love that pizza. And so I wanted to actually try to recreate that memory. I think with pizza, a lot of people are gonna say, um, I love pizza because it reminds me of my childhood memories and it reminds me of 
good memories, you know, when it brings back really good memories. And that's how pizza's always been for me. And so I really wanted to recreate the stuffed crust pizza from Pizza Hut. <laughs> and then Tommy was like, stop it with all the cheese. Just stop it with spinach and artichoke dip. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, one of the few one of the few suggestions that I made that actually worked out pretty well. Um, I'm pretty opinionated, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm, but I'm often wrong. So, yeah. Wow. And so, wow. That that that's really an uh, interesting. Thank you for sharing. So, uh, for the pandemic, you innovated, and the digital transformation is like yeah. quite crucial in the whole uh, business. Um, and um, but was your location um, perfect also, or you know, during the pandemic? Uh, what did the um, you know, Publishon was practically dead in a sense, you know, during the lockdowns. Uh, yeah. Was it really helpful also, um, the location? Um, I would say it wasn't the best still. For, I, I don't think the location at this point already with the pandemic really did much for us anymore, I mm -hmm. think. Um, it... Because and by the way, that, that's not yeah. sorry. That that's not against the that's not against yeah. the social. This is really yeah. just published on as an area. I think because yeah. you know um, when when there was a lot of business and a lot of clubs, uh, you know, there were a lot of people that were employed, and so I think there there is still a lot of homelessness in the area, um, and I think you know that's maybe one of the things that Inga was talking about. Um, no reflection, obviously, on on the social. Uh, it was really just more more the area, um, so to speak. Sorry, Inga. Oh, it's okay. Um, yeah. Our street is very hidden. Ebro is like a one-way street. It's a very small one-way street. And so we don't get a lot of foot traffic, I guess, is what yeah. I'm saying. So in terms of how it, if it actually helped us in the pandemic, um, I think the, the, the good thing about our space was that the fact that it was um, open air. So, you know, right. yes. people kind of felt comfortable going to a place that was open air. But in terms of foot traffic, it didn't really kind of help us. But in terms of being in an open air location, I think that's definitely something that did help us. Yeah. All right. Uh, I really had fun really talking to you guys. Uh, maybe yeah. just yeah. to wrap it up, um, so your final message to other food entrepreneurs that are, you know, uh, continuing to grind uh, to make their products work. Um, and then, you know, just some final uh, inspirational message from you guys to wrap this up. <clears throat> Okay, I, I would say don't be afraid to innovate, and um, you know don't don't be afraid to to do something that you believe in, that in a product that you believe in, um, and that you think is going to be like a differentiating factor from everybody else. I mean, going back to just the basic of you know your USP, unique selling point. Everybody needs to have one, and so you know stay true to what you you believe is um, true. Be authentic. That's another thing. Um, and yeah, just don't. And, and don't be afraid of innovation for me. Yeah. Well, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> I, I guess <laughs> she's obviously better at speaking than I am. But uh, my, my only advice was be, I think now is a perfect time to lead with a product. And, and, you know, and, and I think when you're not having to focus now on foot traffic, I think you're seeing a lot of great products coming out of uh, subdivisions and condos and so on. And I think that's really great to see. I think, Leading with a product uh, and, and the pandemic and the, and the way in which people are buying now really opens the doors for incredible people in the Philippines to be able to kind of show what they do. And it's not just about, oh, well, I can't afford a really great restaurant. I can't afford to be in a great location. And so, therefore, I'm not going to pursue my dreams. And I think that's the other side of, of us being in a pandemic you can lead with an amazing product and we have things like social media now and we have online ordering sites and all that sort of stuff. I think you you really, if you have a great product and you're really good at it, I think that there's an opportunity. And so I think that there's there should be more opportunities for people who may not have been able to kind of fork out the money to open restaurants. All right. Now, uh, I just have a follow-up question uh, because you mentioned innovation, which is really good. Uh, and... Um, but my question is really more on pricing. Uh, yeah. For innovative products, do you price that on a more premium basis? How do you think about pricing? And in terms of marketing, that innovation would just yeah. would you just let the product speak for itself in Instagram, or would you do a special marketing for that innovation? 
I think marketing is very important regardless of how well your product is. Marketing is always going to be um, the backbone, I think, of every company. Whether you're doing well, there's word of mouth, but still, you need to be able to reach as many people as possible. Um, the difficult thing in the F&B is, you know, getting them to buy again, right? So you need right. to be able to check the box of doing marketing very well, doing being in all platforms, being good at social media, and but at the same time, you know, being having your proper online presence and things like that. The next is really having the product to keep them um, from uh, to keep them returning. And so, in terms of how we price our product, uh, I think a strategy that I, I'm sure other businesses do is we have what's called an anchor product. And in our in our lineup of pizzas, our our um, cost is not equally the same we'll have a higher cost product we'll have lower cost product and i think it's the same for a lot of restaurants um what we do is however it, we do have anchor products that may not generate generate us as much money as, as certain products but we will price it um in in a very um competitive position because the way we see it is that it drives people it gets people in the door and then when they see other products in your lineup they're more likely than not to buy other things as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the way we do our pricing. Where we're, we're, it's not what, set what's your anchor? Different. What's your anchor product? So our anchor products would actually be, have to be our cupping pepperoni because that's okay. definitely something that you don't find anywhere else. And pepperoni is probably what, the number one flavor, you know, for pizzas worldwide. I would say, and um, it's it's definitely one eye catching. It's very Instagram friendly. It's unique to us, um, and but it's not cheap because it's you know it's it's imported. Uh, so there's a lot of costs involved there. So you know we our, our margins for that um, wouldn't be as high as other things that are sourced locally. Anything that's sourced locally will always be cheaper, and mm -hmm. yeah. But we're okay to take that hit because we find that it draws the people in. So there are strategies that you can do with your menu that can kind of you know pull people in. Yeah, yeah. but. But you've always, but you've got to get the customer to buy again, <clears throat> and I think Inga really, really hit the nail on the head there. I mean, you can you can have all the right branding, you can have the most amazing logo, you can be the most coolest thing on Instagram. Uh, whether your brand is worth any weight is about whether the customer is willing to buy your product again, and is the customer willing to send their product or your product to their friends? And I think that you know that you're onto something that's uh, worth investing into when you have a product that people love. People return to buy, and then they buy it for their friends. Yeah. All right. And uh, final uh, marketing tip. Uh, what did you, uh, you know, as we go to another lockdown, uh, yeah. what was the most effective way to send your message across, you know, uh, online uh, that you find uh, was very effective for you guys? Um, what worked for us very well on Instagram, because that's really our major platform in terms of promotion, is authenticity. That's something that we really played big on. You know, we we I think one thing that we didn't do is um, we just let our product speak for ourselves, and it was more of word of mouth that kind of propelled us. Um, you know, we would boost so that people would see the product, um, and we just yeah, we just stayed true to to who we are. I mean, even when you look at the photos that we post on Instagram, it's like you know the product you see is what you're gonna get. We don't have a lot of. Um, Although staging. we should probably, yeah, we don't have a lot of staging style photos, um, but we really just wanted to be just to present the product as it is, as how you would normally get it. Because there's nothing worse than like seeing like I feel like when you're click baited into a really nice looking product, yeah. and then <laughs> and then when it gets to you, it doesn't look anything like what you actually saw. So that's something yeah. that I personally don't like, and so that's something that we didn't want to want to do for cross stuff. So everything you see on Instagram is really just you know, taking with an iPhone, everything's trying, we're just trying to be as authentic and as close to the product um, we can provide as possible to customers. All right. Congratulations again, uh, Tommy and Inga. Guys, um, please share this video to all the food entrepreneurs um, that are, you know, still trying to make it work uh, during this pandemic and lockdown. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was really fun. It was 48 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> really fun, uh, Time flies when you're having guys. fun. <laughs> yes, and uh, congratulations. Uh, really thank impressed. Um, and I'm really wondering about the IT side, how you guys speak figure it out now i know <laughs> <laughs>
because uh, that was uh, really a big part. And thank you for helping everybody sharing your message. Uh, I know this will help out a lot of people as they figure out, you know, this third lockdown. Maraming, maraming salamat. Maraming thank, thank you, Don. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Ingat. you. Bye-bye. Ingat. All right.